Right, so firstly, just like to thank Catapult, um, Chris and Simon for the invite to, to speak today. Um, we're going to talk to you about statistical process control. Now, it's quite a new topic for me. I came across it about 18 months ago, so it's not really an expertise, but hopefully I can share sort of the journey we've been on over that time, um, get your thoughts and hopefully some feedback on what you think. It's worked out quite nicely, really, because I'll touch on some of the points Aaron made and some of the work Sean showed to try and show how that combines and we can use that in the applied world to make decisions on a daily basis with a team. Um, just to show a hand so I know where we're at in the room, how many people have heard of statistical process control? Right, so it's quite a new topic to a lot of people as well. Um, so I'll go over, just at the start, a bit of an overview, try and give us a background of what it is. Um, control charts and control rules is a big part of what the what the system is, so I'll touch on those. I'll give you a slightly different alternative approach to what's been used in the past, which is more aligned with what Sean mentioned earlier. We'll then go on to the application, so how we've been using this for the previous season at Newcastle, uh, give you examples of all the different um, aspects of it, and how it helps us with our decision making at the club. So SPC is a method of quality control, and it allows us to monitor and control a process. Um, it was founded nearly 100 years ago now, so it's nothing new, um, but it is quite interesting when you speak to sports scientists that not many people are using it or have even heard of it. It's widely used in manufacturing, um, and it attempts to understand common cause and special cause, and it's similar to what Sean has mentioned about variation in the data, so how can we understand what's typical variation and what's sort of variation away from the norm. If you think of manufacturing, the way I like to think of it is on a production line, people have to produce exactly the same component, if you like, to a very certain specification. But very early, 100 years ago, they realized that even though they had the best system in the world, there would be very slight deviations within that system, and that's the common cause. But then if the system starts to fail, we might see some special cause variation, and that's when we need to put some interventions in place to bring the system back into control. So the common cause is the natural pattern, I said the normal variation that we would expect to see within a system. I mean, obviously when I say system, we mean the training process and monitoring. So within team sports, that will probably be our periodization strategy. Obviously we know that we don't want the players to be doing exactly the same every day, and so we don't see no variation at all, but we will want to see planned variation. Um, data process and analysis, if we have any different variations in the way we process our data through the catapult system um, or how we analyse it, you will see slight variations within your data. And ecological factors like lifestyle factors, at the end of the day we're working with players and people, not machines, so there are going to be very slight variations in the outputs they give on a daily basis. The special cause variation, that's what we're really interested in. Um, so that's the unusual patterns and the non-quantifiable variation within the system. And again, within team sports, that's when training load errors or unplanned errors, as I like to call them, um, happen. This could be due to injuries or illness. And again, lifestyle factors can play a big part in this as well. Um, if things like sleep and nutrition aren't on point, then they can have a big variation in, within training loads in the training process. So statistical process control really surround, uh, evolves around this control chart and the rules around that. So this might be something you typically see if you, you know, do a Google search or look in the literature. And it's sort of how to analyze time series data. So on a daily basis, there's new data coming into the system. And we know there's a norm to that and a variation within that. And we're trying to see when does the athlete fall outside of certain ranges. And, Historically, that's been used with Z-scores, so we'll get a mean, a standard deviation. When a new data point comes in, we see where that lies within that normal range. Um, and within that, they'll set different control limits. So you can see there we've got zone C is just one standard deviation, up to two, three standard deviations. Now, the control chart rules are how we then analyse the data and assess what's actually happening within the system. So I'll go into these in a lot more depth with the practical examples later, but the first few points you can see on the screen there are around if specific data points fall outside or within certain zones, and the bottom three are more about trends and how the data is sort of changing over time. 
But over the last season, we've sort of developed an alternative approach that is more aligned to Sean, like I said, and trying to understand more about the probability within the system and the variation within that. So the things we have to consider, first of all, is the duration of your baseline. So if that is your mean standard deviation, how many days or weeks or a season, two seasons, do you want to have your baseline? I've went for 42 days, so it's a six-week baseline, and that will continuously move throughout the season, and that will roll on. Secondly, you have to select your method of assessing the variation within that, so that would typically be standard deviation, and then quantifying magnitude of that variation, so that would be typically with the Z-score, as I mentioned, one, two, three, however many standard deviations. With this alternative approach, we've used the standard error of the mean and minimum detectable change. So it's the same equation that Sean showed. We can set different confidence levels within the system for when changes are occurring based on a 75, an 85, and a 95% confidence. So what we do is plug in the Z-score for whichever confidence level we want. We multiply that by the standard error of the mean. And then because we have a change score, so we have one data point and then a new data point coming in, we have multiplied by root two, because we're looking at the error in that score and the error in that score, and that sort of factors in the error in both assessments. So this will take you through step by step a practical example. This is some data from the club over a six week period. We have our training load along the bottom and our chronic load at the top. From this, our chronic load was 8.39. Now I'll touch a bit later on what that actual measure is and the standard error within that was 0.1. So our first confidence level, 75%, we would times that by 1.15 to get this confidence level. Next one, 1.44, and finally our 95% confidence level is 1.96. And you can see there how that gives you three levels above and below where that chronic load is at, so we can start to assess how sure we that a real change has occurred. So what does that look like over a time period? This is 14 days I think we've got here. And you can see how the athletes' data has went above and below certain control limits. And um, that allows us to then apply those rules and see how the sort of the athlete is changing over time and how we might want to adapt their training. So the applications. It allows us to carefully monitor the training process. Um, and I know Aaron obviously touched on that a lot. In his first presentation, it allows us to check and challenge, is a nice little jargon term, but we want to see what is the training load going to occur from the sort of responses, and then we challenge, is that what we want, or do we need to adapt our training load? It's adaptable for each specific environment, so I've mentioned there we use a 42-day baseline, and now how we've adapted our control limits. Anyone could select different rules if that suits their environment more, so it's a very adaptable um, system. And most importantly, I think it's an individualised approach. So we're not talking about monitoring a squad here, we're talking about monitoring each individual on a daily basis. And finally, again, I think it's a good point to make. It's about trying to progress players and not just protect them. I think there's a big issue at the minute where training load monitoring is seen as a way that we always try and hold players back and we're not trying to push them very hard, but we try to use this system to make sure we are pushing players enough. And it's not about just highlighting errors. It can also confirm, has the plan gone to, the training load program gone to plan? So it's not just about highlighting errors. You can also confirm what you hoped would happen. So I'll touch slightly, I've called this the training process, which should probably be called the monitoring process, because it's not the same as what Aaron presented. But for me, you always start with your measure of training load. That goes into your training plan. You should always have a plan so you know what you want to occur. You then obviously conduct training, and then after you will review it. Um, that's where statistical process control can come into both of those aspects, the, both the planning and review phase. But the data that goes into the system, uh, the monitoring system is only as good as the data that goes into it. That's where I'm going to touch slightly on similar concept to what Aaron spoke about. You have to have a theoretical framework. And for me, that is the dose-response relationship. So we have to understand whatever measure we're selecting, what if we plan X amount of load that day, what are the typical responses going to be? If we don't know the responses, we can't plan and adjust training accordingly. And finally, it's a bit of a given now, 
with the sort of advancements Catapult have made, but it should always be valuable and valid and reliable measure. It's important we always check that. So the training load measure that I've always going to show you on this slide is time above maximal aerobic speed. Um, we've already spoke about today how we need external and internal. Possibly this allows us to combine the two because it is an internalised measure of external load because we're individualising it based on an individual's fitness levels. And this is some of the research we've conducted that shows weekly time above mass, so the cumulative amount you will conduct over a week, over a six-week period, has quite a strong relationship with improvements in fitness. And on the flip side of that, what you actually do on a daily basis does have a negative effect on fatigue. So the things we always want to be careful of is we want to build that chronic load, so we need to, we need to train to improve fitness. But having too much at one point will, uh, or any unplanned spikes will cause undue amounts of fatigue. And hopefully statistical process control can help us to manage that. So some practical examples. We've got the six rules here again. I'll just start and go through them with some data we've had from the club this season. So the first rule, single data point outside of the control limits. So that would look something like this. You can see the players training, that's daily changes in chronic load. Suddenly there's a big spike well above the upper control limit. So that might be an unplanned error that we need to adapt. The next day off, we have a system where we can look at this even before the training's happened. Um, we can adjust what they do that day. The second rule is two out of the last three data points beyond zone B. So we're not having as high a magnitude change. We're having some small, repetitive, moderate changes, you could say. Um, you can see in the last two of the last three days there, we've had um, changes above that sort of amber control limit. So we know that is a substantial amount. One day's recovery between that might not be enough, so we might need to adapt subsequent days. Secondly, four out of the last five beyond zone C. Um, very similar, but again, very small changes in training load, but over a sustained period of time might be something that we want to investigate further. And just a quick point, this is obviously on a downward trend this time, so it allows you to both see is the player improving their training load or are they detraining too much? So for this player, this might actually be planned. It might be a planned deload, and we can confirm that our program is working. We've had regular changes in uh, training load. So it's not only just highlighting errors, it is confirming the plan is working often. Seven consecutive data points within the control zone. So we call this over control. So we all know that from our training load, we want to be progressing and underloading players. So we might see sometimes that they're just not changing at all over a seven day period. Um, and we want to obviously change that. We want to be overloading and underloading on a daily basis. Seven consecutive data points trending up or down. So you can see here, we've got seven positive points above zero. And if I give it a bit of context, that would be the training load on the bottom there. You can see it's constantly improving. They've trained or had a game six days in a row there. So their chronic load is constantly increasing. And again, that might be what we want from this player for that week. If it's a planned overload or we might need to rein them back in and give them some recovery strategies going forward. Again, on the flip side, it could be a D load. So we've had seven consecutive data points going negatively there. Um, so it might be we need to increase the training load of this player to improve the training process. And you can see there, their training load along the bottom was a lot lower than the previous player. And finally, the last rule that we look at is mixture or out of control. So you can see this player's control limits are quite tight, so they've probably had a period of quite steady, consistent training load. And then the last seven days have been quite erratic. They've had big, big drop-offs and big increases in training load. Um, so we turn that out of control and we want to try and adapt, adapt that player's training to make it not so undulating. So how can we use this to improve the decision making? Hopefully you've seen that it can help us in the planning and review stages. So if we have a system where our training loads go in even before the training has happened, we can see what might happen in the future um, and adapt the, adapt the day's training accordingly. Can be used to progress and protect players so we're not just saying that player's done too much we need to rein them in that day we can actually use it to try and overload players and secondly it highlights errors 
not just highlights errors, but also confirms the plan is working. So it's not about just saying an error has occurred. It is sometimes about confirming that the plan is working and things have gone to plan. I thought I'd just give you an example of some longitudinal analysis. So I've shown you quite zoomed in examples, which is probably how you would use it on a daily basis. But as part of our review process, we will look at the overview of the season. So you can see it is quite noisy, but it is nice at the end of the season to sort of zoom out and see what, how that looked. So for this player, that's his training load along the bottom over the whole season, um, daily in the red spikes and then his chronic load. And you can see the first half of the season was quite a nice um, sort of consistent training period. His control limits are quite narrow and most of his black dots are within that and he's having sustained spikes and then little deloads within that. However, then something's gone wrong, training load has become a bit more sporadic, control limits have widened um, and that's how it might change over the season. This next example is someone who had quite a lot of injuries and you can see that it just doesn't look as nice to look at really. Um, that's one of the things that we don't really know yet how certain these things impact on performance or injury risk but you can just tell as a practitioner that that isn't something possibly that we want to see. And you can see he's trained a load along the bottom, he's trained, had a big increase in chronic load, then got an injury, had quite a nice rehab, sort of chronic load built up, then picked up a couple of little niggles over the season, and his, his control limits just sort of spike up and down throughout the whole season. So this might help us next season. Um, we want to see more consistent training from our players, nice steady control limits in our up and down um, changes within that. So future developments. We're obviously going to start continue developing this process. We've only used it now for one season. Um, so we'll continue to adapt those control chart rules. Possibly use an exponentially weighted baseline instead of a rolling baseline. Um, if you think whatever training load drops off the end and a new training load comes in, it's going to have the same influence on the whole system over a six week period. So if we exponentially wait the last few days or weeks, that might give us a better indication of what's actually occurring. Um, I think a multivariate analysis would be quite interesting. Um, we've mentioned we've used time above mass because we have a really strong theoretical th framework behind that. But possibly I know that that isn't the one measure that's going to tell us everything we need to know. So we could in include some other measures. Um, and I'd also like to start trying to create some decision trees or algorithms so when certain rules are flagging up and the data is looking a certain way, we have a system and a process in place where we adapt the training and we speak to coaches and we um, try to come to a decision based on an actual framework. We want to look at the association between this system and specific outcomes, so things like fitness, fatigue and injury. So do we see when a player gets injured that certain rules are flagging up more than others? Um, or when players are at their best fitness levels, how what's gone in the previous and the last few weeks? We probably need a few years worth of data to then start to understand that. And lastly, you'd like to start applying this to other time series data. So this sort of system could be applied to any data that you're collecting on a daily or weekly basis. So it lends itself to things like wellness and fatigue monitoring. I think I've went well under time there, but thank you, and I'll take any questions. <laughs> <laughs>